You're watching Tag TV. Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. India and Central Asian nations vow to fight against terror and drug trafficking. Pakistan pushing large quantity of drugs for terror funding. And Afghans face uncertain future in war-torn country. Peace brings development and India has joined hands with its allies in Central Asia to fight against terror and bring peace in the region for prosperity. Recently, New Delhi hosted India-Central Asia dialogue that concluded with a strong call for humanitarian support and assistance to Afghanistan and the need to prevent the country's territory from being used for terrorism. However, this crucial meeting coincided with another gathering that took place in Islamabad, where actions of the Taliban were justified by the host country. A report. The situation in Afghanistan has changed quickly and abruptly. It has raised many questions regarding the law and order situation in the region. India and leaders of countries across the world are discussing Afghanistan and its path forward. The fallout of the Taliban takeover of Kabul on regional security was recently in focus as foreign ministers of India and five Central Asian states held their third dialogue in New Delhi. India and the Central Asian states agreed to uphold UNSC resolution, which demands that Afghan territory not be used for sheltering, training, planning, or financing terrorist acts. Uh, excellencies, we all also share deep-rooted historical and civilizational ties with Afghanistan. Our concerns and objectives in that country are similar. A truly inclusive and representative government, the fight against terrorism and drug trafficking, ensuring unhindered humanitarian assistance and preserving the rights of women, children and minorities. We must find ways of helping the people of Afghanistan. As the meeting got underway, several kilometers away in Islamabad, another one kicked off around the same time. The agenda was more or less the same, the intention not so much. It was the 17th extraordinary session of the OIC Council of Foreign Ministers in Islamabad on the Afghan situation. However, the five Central Asian foreign ministers had chosen not to break their meeting in New Delhi to attend the OIC meet, which was held hurriedly in Islamabad. The OIC gathering proved to be the failed attempt of Pakistan's way of telling India that it has the upper hand when it comes to Afghanistan. In the meeting, Imran Khan did it again, what he has been doing for several years, supporting the Taliban and their actions while rationalizing all forms of discrimination, especially against women. He urged the international community to be sensitive to tribal customs while justifying the Taliban banning young girls from schools. Now the point is, we must understand that every, when we talk about human rights, every society is different. Every society's idea of human rights and women's rights are different. Kabul, culture in Kabul was always different to rural areas. Just like in Peshawar, it is completely different, the culture, to the district adjoining the Afghanistan border. So I give you an example. We give stipends to the girls' child's parents to put the girls into school. But in our uh, tr uh, tribal districts or the district adjoining Afghanistan, if we, if, uh, if the, if we are not sensitive to the cultural norms of the, those people, even with stipends, they won't send the girls to school. International conferences are platforms for countries to come together and combat global issues, but Pakistan is using them as theaters. 
the notorious South Asian country is misusing these international platforms for baseless and malicious propaganda against India. This time again, Pakistan went back to push the Kashmir rhetoric during the OIC meet, which was organized to discuss the ongoing humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan. PM Khan, who is barely managing to govern his own country, just aims to appease the radicals who are posing him a major challenge. Pakistan's choices so far have been bad for itself. It has better options, but it may not necessarily take those. Let's move to India, Jammu and Kashmir, which remains a victim of Pakistan's sponsored terrorism. Out of frustration, Pakistan-backed terrorists in the valley are killing innocent civilians and security personnel to create unrest in Jammu and Kashmir. To demoralize the force, unarmed policemen are also being targeted in the region. We have a report. The militancy in Kashmir is witnessing a shift in pattern. Jammu and Kashmir police and civilians have emerged as the prime targets. Official data from 2021 show that for the first time in a year, the number of police personnel killed by terrorists has outnumbered the collective toll of other security personnel who were targeted in the valley. Recently, again a policeman and a civilian were targeted in two different incidents. In the first, terrorists fired at a property dealer Rof Ahmad Khan in Srinagar's Eidgar. Within 30 minutes of the first attack, another terror strike took place in Beach Bejara area. An assistant police sub-inspector Mohammad Ashraf shot and rushed to a nearby hospital. Both the victims were later declared dead at the hospitals they were receiving treatment in. The Inter-Services Intelligence designated the Resistance Front has taken responsibility for both the terror attacks. This terror outfit has come to light recently after it took responsibility for the multiple killings of civilians of minority communities in the valley. See, what is happening in the Kashmir Valley is that after Operation All Out and then the abrogation of Article 370 in 2019 the, and making of the two union territories out of the state, the law and order situation is now fully under control. The total number of militants that have been killed right from the top and all their ID experts and the other experts who were in uh, recruitment experts and also their commanders is more than 200. Now this has created a big vacuum and has all de nearly demolished the entire militancy terrorism network over there. This has disturbed Pakistan very much. And Pakistan is now using its proxies of the underground overground workers and has directed them to make these random killings, whether it's of civilians or it's of policemen or anyone whosoever is there, so that it sends a message across to the people there that look, terrorism is still alive. The incidents of targeting civilians in Kashmir are barbaric. Innocent people who are working for society and have nothing to do with anyone are being targeted. This is an attempt to create an atmosphere of fear and to give it a communal color so as to damage the communal harmony in Kashmir. Terrorists belonging to the outfits like the Resistance Front are acting on the directions of the agencies across the border in Pakistan so that Kashmir is kept disturbed and hurdles are put in the way of peace in valley. Pakistan has totally in a morass of terrorism, militancy and also gun culture. If you see in Pakistan, there is law and order is not there. The people are dying of hunger and the Pakistani government is running with a begging bowl all over. The only problem with Pakistan is that America somehow or the other, it still does not want to abandon it because of its own problems. And that is the reason why it keeps defending Pakistan in most of the forums. Since the abrogation of Article 370, Indian security forces have managed to foil all the devious agendas of Pakistan and maintain peace in the valley. 
This is the reason behind the disappointment of the Pakistani establishment and Pakistan-sponsored terrorists in the valley. The recent brutal killings of innocent civilians and security personnel in Kashmir reflect the frustration among the terrorists and their mentors across the border. However, such barbaric terror acts will not succeed in undermining Jammu and Kashmir's development journey, as people in Kashmir will not let this conspiracy succeed. Pakistan's primacy in the international narcotics trade and the funding of terrorist activities has been time and again confirmed by several investigation agencies worldwide. There are clear indications that Pakistani-based narco-terrorist networks have stepped up their activities on the Indo-Pakistan international border. The recent seizure of huge quantities of heroin from Pakistani drug peddlers has once again shown how narco-terror has become a major concern for the law enforcing agencies in India. Take a look. On many occasions, recovery of drugs in different parts of India has made it clear that Pakistan is not only sending militants but also pushing narcotics in the country. Recently, six Pakistani nationals were arrested with 77 kilograms of heroin worth 400 crore rupees off Gujarat coast in a joint operation by Gujarat ATS and Coast Guard. Such operations were being conducted for the past few months regarding reports of drug smuggling. According to reports, a large consignment of banned heroin was to be brought from Karachi port in the ship Al Husseini. Preliminary interrogation of the captured Pakistani nationals revealed the heroin was supplied by two Pakistani smugglers identified as Haji Hassan and Haji Hassam. It was to be delivered to people associated with the underworld in Punjab. This is a big season in 77 kg heroin and this is a Pakistani boat, Al Husseini. This is a crew member. छः के छः पाकिस्तानी हैं और कराची के रहने वाले हैं उन लोगों को पकड़ा गया है और उनके पास से ये 77 के जी हीरोइन मिली है। The latest seizure of heroin is an indication that there has been no let up in the trend of Pakistan-based syndicates using maritime routes for drug trafficking in the region. Pakistani drug cartels have been trying to use the Gujarat coast as the transit route because of its proximity to the neighboring country. The Gujarat Anti-Terrorist Squad has seized drugs valued at over 1,900 crore rupees since 2016. And out of these, narcotics worth 1,000 crore rupees have been recovered this year alone. Pakistan's former economy is in a poor state. Everyone knows that the narco money is being used to fund the terrorists as well as to generate money through irregular means and therefore with Haqqani in the government in Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan finds that this is a lucrative trade and therefore the drug cartels are trying every possible means to send the narcotics into India and create a market and also spoil the new generation. Narco-terrorism is an integral component of Pakistan's state sponsorship of cross-border terrorism used so as to fund and conduct asymmetric warfare against its neighbors. Over 80% of drugs in India are infiltrating from neighboring Pakistan. This was revealed last year in an article titled Demystifying the Drug Menace, which was published in EU Reporter. This article was based on a survey in which 872 responses were collected. The involvement of Pakistan in the trafficking of illicit narcotics was also disclosed to the Washington Post by former PM Nawaz Sharif in an interview published in September 1994. In the interview, Nawaz Sharif revealed that Pakistan Army and ISI had proposed a blueprint for selling heroin to pay for the country's covert military operations. Pakistan knows that it cannot fight a conventional war with India. 
and therefore it continues to raise a asymmetric war in which narcotics has a major role to play because narcotic money is not in formal economy and therefore cannot be caught by fatf so they keep sending this money as far as india is concerned our strategy should be that we should be able to firstly prevent it in entering india by good border fencing good border defenses as well as good intelligence good surveillance and technologically empowering the border security forces pakistan has constantly tried to upgrade its proxy and hybrid war strategy to challenge india's internal security indian security forces also need to be more vigilant as the country can no longer afford to be stuck on the back foot to foil pakistan's designs At the end of the decades long deadliest war in recent human history the people of Afghanistan are facing the catastrophic crisis of hunger and destitution rather than addressing this humanitarian crisis Taliban the de facto rulers are busy enjoying the victory over United States our report few nations endured a tumultuous as Afghanistan in 2021 and the country was are far from over For the Taliban, the biggest challenge remains being able to transform from an insurgent force into a political and administrative body. The generation of young Taliban fighters that conquered Kabul has gone through the euphoria of victory to face an uncertain future. Most have known only fighting and while their battlefield memories may be a source of pride, they must now adjust to a world that wants to forget about war. For months after the fall of Kabul, many still bask in the achievement of overcoming the United States and its allies after a struggle that ruled their lives for so long. Uh, when I was in the American war, I was in the war for about 14-15 years. At that time, I was in the war for about 14-15 years. At that time, I was in the war for about 14-15 years. At that time, I was in the war for about 14-15 years. At that time, I was in the war for about 14-15 years. یعنی کم کم مبارزه میکوله کله چې زده شل کالو شو ما نو بیا ما خپل پول پراټ هم د مجاهدین سره ما په وخت کې یعنی ما قانوني امر هم د جګړې د پاره ما غو مناسب و many children born after 2001 growing up hating america and trained by the taliban say they don't know if the 911 attacks ever happened many refuse that the attacks were orchestrated by al qaeda The Taliban claimed that Osama bin Laden was not involved in 9/11 attacks and he was used by America to wage war against Afghanistan. The احداث دي تقريبا د شل کاله کې چې امریکانو په موږ باندې حمله کړې او موږ هواد اشغال کړې او یوازې د پوځي برخه نه وه دې ټول برخه په کار باندې چولې او غد رسنه د لارې څخه او د نور لارې څخه او د خلک ځخنه مشخص کړې و یعنی دې په هر لاره باندې په موږ خلک ته ټولنې ته نړیوال ته بعد معرف کړې و These young Afghan Taliban members are uninterested in upholding basic freedoms for millions of Afghan women who have largely been constrained to their homes in recent months. The Taliban have been placed under immense pressure to support the rights of women by the international community which has mostly frozen funds for Afghanistan since the group seized control of the country. Instead, in their four months of rule, the Taliban's leaders have imposed limits on girls' education and banned women from certain workplaces. آینده خانم ها واقعا تاریک است به نظر خودم اگر خانم ها را حق بتن به حکومت حق بتن به ترقی و پیشرفت و بخش فرهنگی اگر حق بتن خانم ها طبعا پیشرفت میکنن و اگر حق نتن آینده تاریک دارن Millions of lives in Afghanistan depend on how the Taliban government chooses to rule the country Taliban needs to be given a hard choice either to accept the terms on women's rights or manage the crisis. The insurgent group doesn't accept the terms. The converse could be disastrous as it is not a popular regime. A humanitarian crisis could soon turn into a fresh wave of violence against the regime. 
and with that we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We will be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at ani.com. This is Yeshi signing off on behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care. You're watching Tag TV.